All right. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Howard speaking, sitting in for Jeff, who's off this week. So I'm going to um, let Travis uh, show some cases, start off. All right. Great. Yep. See you Can screen. you see my screen? OK, great. Good. Um, I see that University of Maryland is on here. I don't know if Seth is in the room. Right. I'm but this is it. this is a uh, a case of iatrogeny that um, reminds me of one he showed a few years ago. And I'm I'm going to show you a chest radiograph first. And this is this guy's baseline chest radiograph. This is from last year. I think this is just some eventration of his diaphragm. So that's not the finding. Yeah, he's just got a little eventration. Uh, and then he came in as you can see about a week ago on this radiograph and so it's a portable radiograph and he's a big guy but I don't think we can just say that his heart is larger because of technique he's got a much larger cardiac contour on this and so of course in the acute setting you worry a little bit or more than a little bit about uh, pericardial effusion and you can even see it on this thumbnail before I bring it up but um, this will be a a, a poll to the audience that's here and you can see that this is hemopericardium this is very high attenuation and we've got this interesting metallic wire not only in his RV and credit to one of my second year residents who saw this on call and identified that this was actually going through the RV and causing an RV perforation so what's interesting about this thing is you can see there's little like high, you know smaller foci that are very dense throughout this wire that's or this thing that's tangled up in here. Anybody want to guess what this particular thing is? Um, um, um. And I'll go back to the, um, the radiograph because you can actually see part of it down here in the right lower lobe pulmonary artery. So a portion of this has embolized into the right lower lobe as well and you can see that it has these little markers on it. Oh, so, zoom, in, <clears throat> zoom in a bit if you would. Yeah, you can see part of it here, part of it here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, brachytherapy seeds? No. No, it, it's oh. one continuous, it's a contiguous. One continuous thing, it can be that. Uh, What's that? No, never mind, it's one continuous thing, it can be that. Yeah. Um, so... Yes, yeah, it's a uh, it's a thrombolysis catheter. I don't know who said that, but you're exactly right. And um, so the story is, this was, as you can see, day before Christmas last year. This guy had a deep venous thrombosis in his lower extremity. They put in this ECOS catheter or this this catheter uh, TPA catheter here in his right leg, and. It is unclear what happened, but it was never taken out. And recently, he went to an outside hospital like a week ago, had a new pulmonary embolism, and they restarted him on anticoagulation. And by report, they mentioned something about a catheter in the RV, but didn't really say much more about it. And then, so I guess now that he's on anticoagulation, I don't know if that's what precipitated this or if it actually perforated within the last week, but this catheter had perforated the right ventricle in three different places and you can see the other portion of it down here in the uh, right lower lobe and so this was just you know over the last weekend this was their uh, operative excerpt that they opened the pericardium there was a huge pericardial uh, uh, hemopericardium and then the RV surface was you know uh, perforating there they said actually said that it, it was like perforated in three different segments at one point or that that's what the surgeon told us so it kind of reminds me of that case that Seth showed of the 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 um, guide wire from a coronary cath that ended up going through the wall. I think it was the left atrium or left ventricle and out into the chest wall. But yeah, this had been there for nine months, and he just presented with this. Oh. So yeah, they it's unclear if they just forgot to take it out or if he left AMA or if a portion of it broke. You know, in his portion of it broke off and then they just didn't realize that what they took out was much shorter than what they'd put in ah. um, but it's uh, who knows and I don't know if we'll ever know but this was definitely you know the radiograph I think it's a good radiograph because the heart is huge but 
you know, this guy is so big, but you can see those tiny little things there. And this it looks like you would see, you know, more centrally when, when they do catheter-directed thrombolysis in the setting of massive PE. But that wasn't the case in this case. This was embolized. And they are long catheters, right? I don't know how long is long, but they are relatively long. Yeah, things. yeah that's right. Sure. So I don't, yeah, yeah, and I don't know how long this one was, but, you know, longer than that. Oh, okay. So, so misadventures. Uh, this is an, an, a sad case, but uh, it's an interesting imaging case, and we've seen this before, but this is a lady who had, she's in her 80s, 89, She'd had a recent myocardial infarction and had declined any sort of intervention at the time. And this was probably a couple weeks before this study. And she came in with worsening chest pain and hypotension and dyspnea. And um, they did a dissection protocol in the, in the ED. And you don't really see much other than it looks like her, her RV's you know, borderline enlarged. Obviously, she does not have a dissection. But the, the interesting thing was on the, the CTA, and you'll see that her RV is pretty dilated, and she's got some straightening of her interventricular septum. And as you scroll inferiorly, and one of our residents also astutely picked this up overnight, that you can see that there's an acquired VSD. And she did have an inferior myocardial infarction. And so this is a just a, an acquired VSD from rupture related to her myocardial infarct. Now, she again elected not to have anything done and, and passed away a couple hours after this study. What I don't know, and, and I don't think we'll ever know, but notice how close this is how, to the pericardium. And basically, you know, did I wonder if she ruptured not only into the RV causing this acquired BSD, or, but if she could have also ruptured into the pericardial space and resulted in, in tamponade and, and acute demise as well. And I know, I think it was Catherine Olson that showed one of those combined VSD ruptures, but also rupture into the pericardial space from an MI as well. Um, but just another example of one. And I think that even if you overlook this at first, the fact that her RP and her right atrium are, are dilated, not knowing even not having anything prior, always look for a shunt. And in this case, this was an acquired shunt. But I think and you guys might agree that that's could have already perforated into her pericardium at that point. And in fact, you know, now that I look at this, you wonder if there's a little bit of contrast right there. I don't know. Actually, no, that's just, never mind. That's just the, the PDA going by that. But um, yeah, just a nice example of, a, of an acquired ventricular septal defect. And it's interesting that you can see the um, I go back to the axial, as I always like to show in cases like this, you can see the subtle difference in contrast, the little basically contrast jet where this is lower, you can see it squirting into there Excellent. with slightly less, less opacified contrast from the left to right. So, Kudos to your resident, great observation. Now, I don't, is David on? Let's see, I don't, I, I don't have the list up. Um, this is really no, no, he isn't. Okay, well, I'm I'm going to show this anyway. This is the best example of this sign on a radiograph that I've ever seen, and and I already, and I don't know if I would have, if I would have prospectively, I mean, I would have detected this abnormality, but I don't know if I would have accurately realized what it was, um, because there's no other other findings for this thing. But this was reported as an abnormal left paratracheal mass, which prompted a CT that I'll show you in a moment. Um, at an outside hospital, but I think they presumed that this was the aorta and that this was a mass. The only problem with this being the aorta is that it's too low and it essentially projects over the pulmonary artery and you can see your like aorticopulmonary stripe right in here. And um, so Howard, I heard you had a pretty immediate reaction and I'm guess I'm wondering if you think you're thinking what I think you're thinking, but this is an actual three sign yes. on a radiograph yes. from from a legitimate coarctation, but notice that you know there's not really any rib notching in this case, and um, you can see on the lateral view too that again left pulmonary artery is going to be right here because you can see the left you know the the left main stem upper lobe continuum I think right here so this is too low 
but this is that shelf right there from the three. Um, <clears throat> now I was always, you know, we, we evaluate coarctation here at UCSF a little differently than I always did before, and I'll get to that in a second, but here you can see the coarct, and it's not really that, what I would call severe coarctation, and, and his blood pressure, he was in like the 140s when they measured his upper extremity, he's 31 years old, and you can see he really doesn't have massive collaterals. You know, his internal mammary is maybe a little on the plump side. And he doesn't really have big intercostals either. I mean, so I, I would have said, you know, normally that this might not be, you know, a very significant, you know, hemodynamic lesion because there's, it was like 10 by 14 millimeters when we measured it. Um, but one of my colleagues, and this goes back a while that they've been doing this, and you can see it right here and see the correlate for the three sign. We do MR in a lot of these patients, and what we do is we'll do phase contrast imaging, and we'll do it in two places. You'll do it like right here in the descending thoracic aorta, a few centimeters below the coarctation, and you're doing flow quantification. And then we also do it down at the diaphragm, like right in here. And I have both of those images here. I, I don't have the numbers for you, but the idea is that normally, you know, blood should be going out of the descending aorta. So at the diaphragm, you should have less volume of flow in the aorta than you do you know, more proximally. It just makes sense because flow should be going out. But, you know, it's a technique we've done, and I don't know if anybody else is doing it because we never did this at Emory or at Wash U. Um, but in the, I, the idea with a hemodynamically significant coarctation is that because collateral flow will reverse through the intercostals and back into the aorta, that you'll have more flow distally in the aorta than you will up here, which makes sense. Um, and so from this flow, it was, it was like 25% higher, the volume of flow at the diaphragm, than it was more cephalad, which is suggestive that this is a hemodynamically significant shunt causing diversion of blood. And you can see there's a little bit of, of uh, just turbulent flow here. They haven't repaired this guy yet, but um, that was a new technique for me. And I actually, there's an article that I pulled up, but I forgot to attach it here. So I don't know, is anybody else doing that that's it's on? Because I think it's an interesting technique, and at least mechanistically it makes sense. So, yeah. well, if you're interested, I'll send out the, I'll attach the article too, and I think it, it helps in some of these cases where you otherwise have questions. Great. Um, I'll show one more, just because it seems like we have a lot of people on here. This is, um, I've shown, I think, one or two similar cases in a in a different um, in a different context, but I'll just scroll and uh, stop right on the lesion. And I, admittedly, this is a blind spot, um, but hopefully, everybody realizes that there is this really super hypervascular mass that's intramedullary. It's occupying really the entirety of the spinal canal here, and you can even see this big dilated anterior spinal vessel, probably an anterior spinal artery there, and I think. I've shown one of these in the setting of von Hippel-Lindau, and I may have shown a meningioma enhancing, like in the setting of neurofibromatosis, because that's the only time I really look. But one of my residents saw this, but and then we went digging, and it turns out they know it's there. Um, but this is a guy that came in with with some with some neurologic symptoms, and they ended up doing an MR after a while and showed this avidly enhancing intramedullary mass. So the differential. I'm not going to get into for an intramedullary mass, but something this hypervascular, they were thinking that this was a hemangioblastoma, and that's what it turned out to be. They actually resected this. So I think it's wow. you know just, just a reminder to look at the spine that occasionally you'll see stuff. This is pretty dramatic, though. But, um, yeah, so. Wow. Good pickup. Yeah. It's a good eye test. So, yeah. all right. Well, I'll, I'll leave it there, Howard. I have more I can show at the end. I think. I'm sure Brent has some and others, so. Okay, we can come around to you, sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, Brent, do you have cases uh, this week? Do you want to show? Uh, yes, I have a couple cases. All right. Do you see your dialog box? Did that come up for you? Um, I think it, it, it's the other Brent Little on the... Um, there's Brent L., and that, that should be me.
Okay. How about okay. now? I've got it. Let me um see if I can choose the right screen here. Okay, can you see my screen? Oh, not yet. Now we do. Oh, okay. Okay, this first case, I'm just going to show a couple cases because the second one is a little bit long. Um, so uh, this case, um, just a very interesting case. Um, don't have the final answer, but, well, we have one of the, the answers on this case. But you can see that, um, bring up the long windows here, uh, we have a... Uh, a lot of peripheral reticular opacities um, within the mid to lower lungs with architectural distortion. Um, this is a fairly young patient um, in the early 50s. And as we come down, we can see more and more reticulation, some distortion, fissural uh, distortion. And you can see that there's a wedge um, biopsy site in here. And this is biopsied and um, is a UIP pattern at biopsy. And this patient had chronic shortness of breath. Um, the other interesting thing here is that uh, you notice that a lot of the distal vessels are very plump here, the distal pulmonary arteries, um, and they go um, all the way to the to the edge of the, the lung, to the pleural surface here, um, and they touch the pleural surface, which is not normal. I'll show you that um, the uh, upper abdomen here shows um, that the liver actually has a cirrhotic contour, um, nodular contour here, and the spleen is certainly uh, markedly enlarged, um, so there's splenomegaly. And this patient had cirrhosis and had this interesting pattern of um, distal enlargement of the pulmonary arteries here, and um, had an echo uh, done, and the echo with a bubble study was, was positive. Um, and it was positive on, uh, you know, the fourth or fifth beat, and so this is a case of um, hepatopulmonary syndrome, um, and these enlarged pulmonary vessels uh, represent uh, shunting at the distal uh, aspect of the, the lung periphery here. And, um, you know, I know that Travis has shown and other people have shown uh, several cases of this, but the interesting thing is about this is that not only is there cirrhosis and hepatopulmonary syndrome with um, shunting, um, shown on an echo that I, I'm not going to show you, but uh, there's also cirrhosis, and um, we've seen uh, a couple of these cases so far. Um, this is very suggestive of an anti-telomere syndrome uh, that can cause um, both cirrhosis and um, a, um, idiopathic, uh, well, it's not quite idiopathic, but a UIP pattern with fibrosis. Um, so I'm still waiting to, to the uh, full panel of anti-telomere um, uh, or sh sorry, short telomere um, um, labs have yet to come back, uh, but I'm guessing that this is a good case of um, short telomere syndrome, and I'm um, just showing you because it looks like the other cases of short telomere syndrome that we've seen um, so far. So I just wanted to see if, uh, have other people uh, seen similar cases of short telomere syndrome? Nope, never even heard of it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I like it because he—you said he's what in his early fifties. Yes, yes. So some sort of right, some sort of familial UIP or familial IPF, and right, and then the cirrhosis. We've had a couple patients where that's been a, the, an issue too. Now, is he? Um, did, does he have a history of premature graying? Because that's one of the co the most common questions that people here love to ask the patients when there's any history of of telomere shortening, just going gray like in their teens or early twenties. Yeah, that I that I don't know. I'll get back to you on that. So that that's that's a good point. Yeah, I don't know for this particular patient what the answer is, but I'm I'm guessing the answer is yes. Because that's a um that was what I when I first came here last year that at our ILD conference that's one of the first things they'll mention in any patient is whether or not they went any, any history of early family you know gray hair in the family or in them. Wow. Yeah, that's See, a great point. Know, they, um, yeah, get back to you on that. Anyone know the pathogenesis between the telomere and the liver disease and the lung disease? Or is that just an association that no one understands? I don't, well? I don't know if it's well understood. I mean, presumably it hap you know it happens because of some sort of just generalized cellular senescence that affects the liver and 
affects the lung, but I, I'm not sure if that's been well studied. I know there is a growing literature on um, short telomeres and other conditions, even in COPD, some people have been studying whether shortened telomeres are active in, you know, more pronounced cases of, of COPD, of emphysema, and, and things like that. So I think that we have a lot more to learn about um, short telomeres and, and not just, you know, in dramatic cases like this, but in other diseases that we don't even suspect yet. So I, I think that um, one of the things, just since telomere shortening is, is related to age, um, related findings that it um, I don't have an eloquent answer but basically you know it affects DNA damage and and cellular repair and so it and I don't know the I don't remember the exact pathogenesis in the in the setting of, of lung or liver injury but I just think the idea is there's limited ability to repair injury and it also occurs at a, at a, y a younger age I'll, I'll pull up an article and send it to you wow right great and don't, don't know about that at all huh Okay, and then just the other case I have is, let me um, go to this one. Let me see if I can see which screen is being shared. Do you see a chest x-ray? Yep. Chest radiograph? Okay. Okay, so I'll show this chest radiograph uh, first and let you take a look at the chest radiograph. This is a 30-year-old uh, woman who came in um, with a history of palpitations and let people take a look at that for just a couple seconds and then instead of going to the other imaging I'll go to the lateral here oh, pull up the lateral here okay and because um, you know she was having palpitations I'll go to an echo uh, that was done uh, can people see the mm -hmm. echocardiography here good okay okay so here's the echo that was done um, around the same time as that chest radiograph. And um, playing this, this loop here, um, here's the left ventricle, here's the septum, lateral wall. And you can see that the apex here is moving quite well, uh, but the rest of the heart, uh, the mid ventricle and the base, is not moving very well at all. Um, you can let you look at that just a little bit more there. So apex moving very well base and mid ventricle not moving so well. Let me um, go to back to the chest radiograph. And of course on this chest radiograph uh, this um, mass was seen um, and this was around the same time as the echo was done and this was just thought to be incidental uh, mass that needed further evaluation. So the next thing that was done um, was a chest CT, and I'll show you the chest CT here. Go to get that. Okay, so here's the chest CT coming down, and you can see the what was responsible for that mass is this um, wow. perpetual opacity, or this mass here. And let me blow this up a little bit to um, show you the character of this this mass. So this is a paravertebral mass, and you can see that it's remodeling, if I change the window, it's remodeling the vertebral body a bit, um, just subtly, and subtly remodeling some subtle sclerosis there. The character of the mass, it's very avidly enhancing here, and I believe this was, you know, in the 100 pounds foot unit and above range, um, avidly enhancing there. Um, and um, so, you know, we saw this and thought, well, you know, this is so avidly enhancing, it, it certainly looks like it's a uh, proper location for a nerve sheath tumor, and with this amount of enhancement, you know, could this, in fact, be a paraganglioma? Um, could it be a paraganglioma? Um, so let me, let me show you the next study that was done, kind of prompted by the, the echo. Um, I'll show you the MR that was done. So here's an MR that was done, and we'll show you the um, T2 kind of scout images here. And you can see that here's the paravertebral uh, <clears throat> mass again, right there. And we'll show you the, uh, the Sene images that were done. Um, confirm that um, the apex is moving quite well, but the mid ventricle and the base not moving very well at all. And I can show you in some of the other views, the three chamber view, Apex moving really well, the mid ventricle and base not moving well at all, just very 
kind of akinetic there. And I'll show you, um, in case you're going to think that this is a uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy of some kind, I'll show you the uh, late Galileo enhancement showing that really um, there's no abnormal delayed enhancement of the left ventricle here. It's all um, very nicely nulled. So this is very typical for a uh, reverse Takotsubo um, case where um, the instead of the typical Takotsubo where the, um, the ventricle is not moving very well at the apex and you have apical ballooning um, and uh, akinesis um, or dyskinesis here you have a reverse configuration of that where the uh, base and the mid ventricle are not moving very well, so it's called a reverse Takotsubo um, cardiomyopathy. And um, the interesting thing is if you think back to the CT that we showed um, here, um, if this was a paraganglioma, then that might explain uh, why um, there was a Takotsubo or reverse Takotsubo. Um, because of the release of, uh, you know, epinephrine or norepinephrine from a tumor like this. Well, let me show you one other thing that was done here. Um, here was a Octria scan that was done on this case, and I'll show you, I think I have the, here are the early images here, so I don't really see much here within the mass on the early images, maybe just a little bit of, um, you know, kind of background level here. Um, let me go to the 24-hour uh, images here. I'll go to the fused images and move that around and go down here. And um, to my eye, this is actually above baseline uptake. And I think uh, originally this may have been, you know, not thought to be so dramatic um, when it was when it was read out, but. But it looks like there is a little bit of at least uh, uptake on the delayed 24-hour delayed images here. So, um, and I'll go back to this. And um, the patient continued to have palpitations, and um, laboratory values were, of course, measured, thinking, could this be a paraganglioma? And the norminephrine did, in fact, come back about six times the upper limit of normal, so dramatically abnormal. Um, this uh, was uh, resected uh, about a week ago, and this did in fact turn out to be a paraganglioma. So I just think that's a that's a you know case of a um, it's it's a very nice case of a reverse type SUBO caused by um, a uh, metabolically active um, and uh, endocrine active uh, paraganglioma. And the interesting thing about reverse uh, type SUBO is that. You know, we, we see older patients certainly with um, true Takotsubo where you have, and I'll, as I'm talking about this, I'll pull up the uh, pull up the the Sene images again, where you have apical ballooning and, and apical uh, akinesis or dyskinesis. But it's interesting that there's a, there's some literature on the distribution of the beta receptors of the heart um, in uh, younger versus older patients, and apparently the distribution can flip, um, so that the distribution um, during youth actually is different um, from uh, base to apex than it is um, in older age. So presumably that's why uh, the beta receptor is acting in this way. That's why we have a reverse Takotsubo in this patient who's fairly young. Um, but in, in many other cases of a stress-related cardiomyopathy, you get a true um, apical distribution of this. So I just thought that was an, a very nice example of many different interconnected pathologies here, including uh, the cardiac pathology. So that's, Brent, that's a fantastic case. And I, you may not have been on a few months ago. I showed a case almost identical to that. It was a patient who came in with Takasubo after like some sort of, I think it was an orthopedic surgery, uh, but we noted that there was a right adrenal mass that was incompletely evaluated. A couple months later, they finally did a adrenal protocol and decided it was probably a pheo, took it out, and that's when we put everything together, that it was a, a pheochromocytoma-induced uh, stress cardiomyopathy. And uh, I found a couple of case reports, but yeah, so this is another case of the same thing, just in a, diff, you know, obviously reverse Takasubo instead of the normal distribution, but the same yeah. concept. That's fantastic. Yeah, I know that I know that we've talked about that before, and I missed that particular case, but I know you have, you know, a couple other cases of that, and um, 
Yeah, and it may, it may actually, the, this interesting, uh, the distribution of the beta receptors, it may have something to do with um, postmenopausal versus premenopausal state, and there's a lot of complexity. And uh, so, anyway, this was one of our most exciting cases recently, but I'll, I'll stop there. Great case. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't know if you were is there anyone else on that would like to show cases? I don't see Seth. I can show a couple, then we'll come back to Travis. How's that sound? Sure. Okay. All right, this is um, an interesting case. So this is um, one that presented to um, a resident, a patient in the ICU. And I'll give you a moment to look at that. Um, dramatically abnormal. Perhaps you wouldn't be surprised that someone was concerned about pneumothorax and particularly tension pneumothorax, at least in the sense that the findings associated with rightward deviation of heart and mediastinum, and there's some opacity in the right upper lobe. Um, but take a look at that for a moment, and I will tell you that um, what happened next was a chest tube. And you can see from this that the drainage tube is located in the basal left hemithorax, but the fi findings are otherwise unchanged. So the tube went in. Of course, I don't know what the finger felt, but that's where the tube went in. But that pseudo-pneumothorax was not decompressed, of course. So if you look at that, it's not typical for a pneumothorax. We don't see the collapsed lung in the usual place. We don't see the pleural line along a pleural surface in the usual place, of course. And then there is this curvilinear interface in the upper left hemithorax, above which we see what appears to be some compressed lung. So this looks really quite odd. Then, of course, the history is important. Um, this person had a laparoscopic repair of a paraesophageal hiatus hernia, apparently quite uneventfully, two or three days before that. This just shows uh, the pre-op imaging. So, of course, we thought this is not a pneumothorax, so I will bring up the uh, coronal here to show you that, yes, indeed, that is the stomach. Up there, there is some compressed left lung, of course, and then take a look and see where the stomach is distended and where it goes through the a defect here near the esophageal hiatus. And of course, this thing did not actually go into the stomach, fortunately. Prior to the CT, you can see they did put a tube in the esophagus and it goes that far near the GE junction, not further. So that is indeed a complication related to the surgery. Let me bring up alongside the up report for some excerpts from that, as you can see there. So almost entirely into a thoracic stomach. I initially looked a bit dusky or an ischemic appearance, but that improved during the operation. They found a small perforation in the posterior stomach at the side of that and fixed that. But otherwise, interestingly, they said the diaphragmatic repair appeared intact as far as we could observe. The toupee fundoplication was intact. So I'm not quite sure what happened here, other than the fact that the stomach did go up into the chest. It is obstructed here a bit. And just an interesting complex of findings. That was a, a pseudo-pneumothorax, but the stomach being up there. So as you can see there, they, they fixed that. And I think he's doing okay. And presumably, maybe some aspiration might have happened into the right upper lobe, perhaps. So an interesting uh, overnight ICU kind of case. Uh, this is just a nice companion to case that we saw to one um, <clears throat> that Jeff showed. I think the guys at uh, Augusta sent this case. So this is a really nice companion case. So observations, frontal and lateral projection of the chest. You might understand why someone raises a concern about a left hilar lesion of some kind. I'll bring up the lateral projection because there's really nice anatomy here. So the question is, 
is it a mass or where is it exactly? So here we have left upper lobe bronchus, RPA over here. Here is the opacity, or at least a portion of it. And it sure looks like a nice big fat left pulmonary artery. So let me bring up the sagittal from the CT that was done after that, because there's a nice correlation, of course. So there you see that dilated main pulmonary artery. There is the big left that corresponds very nicely with the radiograph. And then um, I don't have, I don't do really cardiac uh, imaging very much or at all. So would you guys who do cardiac things say that it's reasonable to say if you see the valves like this, that's really suggestive of thickened valves that are not moving very well, as in valvular stenosis and the valves looking like that, Travis or Brent? Agreed, especially yes. on a non-gated study. Right. Right. Like, like, yeah. yeah. So I had to dig a bit, but he was apparently diagnosed with so-called congenital heart disease. I guess the congenital heart disease is the pulmonic valvular stenosis. Didn't have surgery for that. I don't really know the details, but just a really nice imaging exam, <clears throat> radiography and CT for pulmonic valvular stenosis with really classic findings of that dilated left pulmonary artery where the jet presumably goes and impinges on that left pulmonary artery particularly as well. And can you blow up the lateral view again, please? The lateral and view of the... Yeah, the lateral radiograph, yeah. Because I think there's a... I think it's a nice example, too, of the uh, Hyler convergence sign because you can see those left lower lobe pulmonary arteries converging with what you were pointing out as kind of the more, you know, more mass-like main left pulmonary artery. Here, sort of in here. Yeah. Right, how they just converge, and you don't, you know, differentiating that from a lymph node, you don't see any sort of inferior margin to that, that thing. It's just continuous. So. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember if the Hyler convergence sign, if that was a Felsen sign or who described that, but I remember one of my, my yeah, senior you attendings always yeah. talking about yeah talking about that as a way to distinguish lymphadenopathy or a mass from just enlarged pulmonary arteries, usually in pulmonary hypertension. But. Right, and he described it really in relation to the frontal projection of the chest rather than the lateral as such, just like yeah. the Harlem overlay sign, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, but I think you can apply it there yeah. on the lateral too, because yeah. you see those big... I think it's a bit harder to do. Converging. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, good. This one is just a, a curiosity kind of case. I'll just go to the coronal image just to show you this variant of the drainage of pulmonary veins, superior pulmonary veins into the atrium. So initially on the CT done not to evaluate uh, vessels, I noticed there was a right top type of pulmonary vein. Actually, let me just go back to that real fast that I could see on the right side and let me just scroll through to there real fast. So notice that over there, as you can see there, and you can trace it to the um, atrium. And then going to the lung, I wondered whether there was an incomplete fissure, but I could trace a vein coming from here and one from the posterior segment, making up that little vein, and then that little vein going up to the top of the atrium. But then I saw this, and this was, I think, kind of cute. So Unless I've not appreciated this before, I'm pretty convinced this is a really unusual place for that left superior pulmonary vein to come into the atrium, right? It's coming right over the top, right into the central part from the left side too, right? And here's the atrial appendage. So that's an unusual course for a left superior pulmonary vein as well. There's the other one. Wasn't there, wasn't there another small branch that came in on the right, like the right middle lobe that, that also came into oh. the roof too? Oh, I missed that, or if I didn't see that, or didn't appreciate that. So yeah, keep, keep scrolling the other, or anterior on that, or whichever direction. Yeah, right there. There's another tiny little guy that's more lateral, but it was, it was a small branch, you know, a little bit smaller than the top pulmonary vein, right? Keep coming. That, yeah, right there. Oh, I didn't even notice that one right there. Okay. So a bunch of funny veins, right? Have you ever seen one that goes like this? A nice big fat superior pulmonary vein, normal, but just going in right there as opposed to more, I think, more like this? 
Or no, because it goes in, it goes in of it. medial to the appendage. Yeah. That is curious. I don't know if I've ever seen oh, it before. Brant, what do you think? I've, I've never seen that. That's very interesting. In fact, on the, I mean, on the left, I have only seen, like, I think one that I could even call just a small top pulmonary vein, you know, like ever. So, but it, it's never been this big. This is amazing. Yeah. Okay. Just a bunch of goofy veins. I didn't, I didn't notice that one, Travis. Good. Yeah. Oh, that's just a curiosity, but interesting. Okay. Uh, this is one that Leif showed me. I can show this really quickly. So this is kind of an incidental finding and it's kind of funny. So it was a really good observation of a small vein that is arising near the celiac axis down here somewhere. I'm going to try and find it again real fast. Leif, uh, kudos to Leif for picking this up. So there's a little vein that's really subtle, but keep your eye on this thing right there. So it's arising somewhere there. And then as I scroll up here, you'll see this vein right there. Make this a bit bigger. And it goes into the lung like that. So it's a real curiosity where there's one systemic artery just poking into the right lower lobe. So we're just calling this an incidental, idiopathic, limited systemic arterial supply to right lower lung. And one may see that without any other findings of congenital things like sequestrations and so on. It's just a, a curiosity as far as I know. If it's any other entity, I don't know what it might be. But just a curiosity for this guy. All right, Travis, I'm going to switch over back to you. Okay. Brent, do you have more that you'll want to show at the end? I can finish up, or I can save you some time, too. Um, I, I'm, I'm okay for this week, I think. I don't have okay. anything else. Anymore. That's fine. Um, it's not a big deal. This one I want to show first, because this is more of a consult. I don't know what's going on here yet, and um, I'm eager to hear what anybody else's thoughts. This is a, a woman who, uh, this study was done in, in July, and she was at an outside hospital. And you can see at this point, she's already got a staple line. She has this little cavity, and I guess she came in with pneumonia. She had some sort of group A strep pneumonia, and also some acute lung injury on the path or, or whatever, and she's got this little residual fluid collection. But at this time, not, uh, I'm, directing you towards the pleura because I'll show you what happens on the on the subsequent study. She apparently has had old histoplasmosis too, has these big chunky lymph nodes. You know, her mediastinal pleura surfaces look okay. She's got a little bit of, of ground glass and architectural distortion. Maybe this is related to the pneumonia, whether or not she had a little organizing pneumonia too. I don't know. But this is the study that we had the other day and the pulmonologists have been coming in every day and soliciting opinions. You can see now she's got this, it, it all measures fluid attenuation, but it's, well, it's somewhat circumferential and it's kind of lumpy bumpy involving the pleural surfaces, especially the mediastinal pleural surfaces, but also you know, the periphery of the lungs as well. And you can see it here along the paravertebral regions, really circumferential, but most notable in those other places. She now also has pretty extensive just peribronco peribronchial cuffing, but it's really thicker than what you normally expect with just edema. I mean, this is really just congestion along the bronchovascular bundles. And um, a couple little of this, again, this looks like fluid, but it's that similar just kind of lumpy bumpy stuff along the pleura. And then these areas of consolidation have gotten a little bit worse in the, in the upper lobes. And, you know, for lack of a better question, the question is, what is it? And they said, you know, she was diuresis. I wasn't crazy about this being edema anyway, just because this is so thick. It doesn't have a known malignancy. Certainly, I'm worried about some sort of lymphatic or lymphangitic carcinomatosis. But then, just I don't know about some other lymphatic process. Even something like Erdheim Chester, what we see of her kidneys look good, but some sort of deposition, be it amyloid, be it cells in the lymphatics. I, I tend to think that this is going to be some sort of lymphatic process, but, but I don't know. They're going to try and do a transbronchial biopsy 
and see what they can get. But I'm just curious if anyone has any good thoughts, you know, or specific you know, entities. And all this is developed since late July, right? Yeah, this is over the course of two months. And not surprisingly, she just has progressive hypoxemia. And yeah, and I'll put them up side by side here and show you, but it's just, it's bizarre. Yeah, and you can see, I mean, maybe she had a little bit of this stuff developing on the right at the time, but I don't know, just because she had a thoracotomy, it really is, you know, dramatically increasing. And yeah, she's old, I don't, like, even lymphangiomatosis or lymphangiectasia, some of those things that if she weren't, I don't know, I tend to think of those as more something we see occasionally in younger people, but I, I just don't know. I mean, even some weird variant of alveolar proteinosis, I've seen crazy paving or, or like more lymphatic distribution of it, but just deposition of something is what I'm, is my best guess because of the, the fact that there's peribronchial thickening and pleural and subpleural stuff implying that this is a lymphatic process. But and she has maybe uh, one circumscribed cyst in the left upper lobe, but that's just one by itself yes. like that? And that was there before? Yeah, that was there before, right. And that would, yeah, and uh, like the amyloid, there's some question about light chain deposition. Yeah, they reviewed the outside path too, interestingly. It was mostly pleural, and there was some lung, but there was no deposition at that time. And this would be you know, awfully rapid for something yeah. like amyloid. I wonder about a lymphoproliferative disorder or a lymphoma yeah. progressing quite quickly. Agreed. Yeah. yeah, and that's one of the right plasma cell cells. Population. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, I think this is going to be cells or something that's deposited in the lymphatics. And looking again at the pleura, what seems to be pleura, does that look like water or could it be tissue, as in cells of lymphoma? Well, it, it all measures. It all measures near zero okay. all of this stuff but but again it could be just cells like you you know like you say with lymphangitic spread that often it's just cells causing congestion of the lymphatics and backup of yeah. fluid so awesome. yeah i don't i don't know yeah so but you agree that it looks like it's some sort of lymphatic process just given the distribution yeah there's certainly septal lines and peribronchial fluid cups on both sides that have developed yeah. So the lung is wet. And the question is, what is the mechanism? Are the lymphatics obstructed? Yeah. Um, there isn't bulky adenopathy to... No, no it's, there's but small it's very, nodes. Very, very conspicuous amount of water in the, in the lower lungs about, yeah. the, about the bronchovascular bundles. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I was, can you compare the... Uh, can you compare the heart uh, scans here? Has the yeah. chylothorax been excluded? Well, and that's a that's a good question. And no, I mean they don't have anything from this yet. So, but I'm just trying to think why you'd get bilateral chylothoraces. But again, that would imply a lymphatic process too. So, I mean, even these. Is the size of the pulmonary artery, is, is that similar across the studies, or has, has the, the PA gotten a little bit larger? No. It's hard to say. Yeah. And she's been, they actually repeated the study this morning because they continued to diurese her. Yeah, it's mm. nearly identical. They continued yeah. to diurese her because they weren't convinced this wasn't just fluid, and nothing changed this morning from four days ago. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just threw that one out there. I'll save it and hopefully get an answer that I can show you at some point in the near future. Um, IgG4 was another thing I thought of, just some sort of cellular proliferation or some sort of deposition, but I don't know. And no hint All of right. abdominal malignancy. Yeah. What's that? No hint of an abdominal malignancy. No, no. Malignancy, okay. Um, so, I, so Brent, I'm, I'm shifting calling an audible here to show a couple of other cases based on what you showed. This is uh, one I've been holding off on showing. I, I have a collection of a few. But this is from our ILD clinic. And this is really, a uh, this guy is young. I think he's, he's 50. And it's kind of a, a bizarre looking ILD. You've got a lot of reticulation and a lot of traction. It's certainly more, the, the fibrosis is more severe in the upper lobes. 
and you even have some upper lobe subpleural honeycombing. So strictly by ATS criteria, it would be inconsistent with usual interstitial pneumonia, you know, just at face value. Uh, we do see some of these younger patients when it's familial pulmonary fibrosis that some of the time they may have an upper lobe predominant distribution. This guy's a non-smoker. Uh, and I think he has family history. And the reason I pulled it up is because, you know, it doesn't look dissimilar from yours other than the distribution, but it's a, a fairly similar pattern of fibrosis. And this patient has, as you'll see, he has dyskeratosis congenita. So this is characterized by skin hyperpigmentation, oral leukoplakia, nail dystrophy. Those are the three. And I, I brought this up. Oh, and it has it here listed. So I bring this up because this is a, um, and he's gone to pneumonectomy and lung transplant. And you'll see it is a UIP pattern, even though the, the distribution's a little funky. But uh, the reason I brought this one up, Howard, I, I have this article, is that, wow. that uh, dyskeratosis congenita is a telomere mutation um, disease. And I think there's a specific, yeah. So, and, and so the idea is DNA damage and inability to repair DNA damage, which progresses, you know, at younger age, or a younger age and, and causes um, damage to, to organ systems. So in these patients, it's mostly skin. And I think the idea is that the respiratory epithelium um, that yeah, they're just saying the telomere shortening. I think there's a discussion. I'll send this one out. But Maybe. the idea is that these patients just have inability to repair DNA damage and can subject them to interstitial lung disease, especially at an earlier age. Now, him, I don't remember, since I just pulled this one up, I don't remember if he has a family history or not. But um, it's definitely a well-known cause, rare cause of interstitial lung disease. But it's one of many inherited forms of, uh, of pulmonary fibrosis. So um, that's one. Excellent. Wow. wow. And uh, this one, this more bizarre one, this is called COPA syndrome. Oh. And you'll see this is from year 2000. And this guy at this time is in his 20s because, let's see, in t he's 30 now in 2015. So he was actually 15 years old. And you can see he's got some upper lobe predominant scar and architectural distortion. As you see, I think the hyla look a little lifted up or raised, and there's a little bit of volume loss. But he's had recurrent pulmonary hemorrhage in the past, and this is what he looks like now, and definitely a more bizarre-looking fibrosis pattern. Yes. You'd almost say that this could be more of, a, it's more anterior, like it could be from old diffuse alveolar damage. Um, but he definitely has some subpleural honeycombing, reticulation, and whatnot. Spares the bases largely. And so it's more upper low predominant, and you can see it just, you know, he's got, it's still a fibrosing interstitial lung disease. And so this is called COPA syndrome. And uh, what's interesting about this one is it's, he also has arthritis. And uh, this is one of our pulmonologists who specializes in these genetic diseases, and he's recently published a paper talking about the genetic basis. And these patients, it's characterized by interstitial lung disease, as you can see, pulmonary hemorrhage and joint disease. And this COPA gene is, um, is responsible for this. And you'll see he actually had pulmonary hemorrhage when he was two years old. And he's been on steroids and all this other stuff. And then he had pulmonary hemorrhage when he was seven, when he was eating cheese, probably unrelated. And then he also, I think, had a family history in him. Yeah, his daughter and four cousins have autoimmune-associated ILD as well. And so they sent this off, and this was a variant of the COPA gene mutation. And I've included a report on COPA syndrome as well. And it talks about the, um, now this is, this is, I believe this isn't necessarily a telomere, but um, it was, I can't remember if this is some sort of, I think this is, um, yeah, some immune regulation that leads to autoimmunity. So it's, it's more along the autoimmune spectrum, but still is a, uh, another familial cause of interstitial lung disease. And the pulmonary so, hemorrhage or episodes of hemorrhage is a distinctive yeah. part of the syndrome? Yeah, and I think they say, yeah, the hemorrhage, uh, somewhere in here it says that too. Sorry, I, I just pulled these up now since no, the friend had showed that. I thought they were relevant at this point. So uh, there may be but, some people walking around or some kids that are labeled as primary pulmonary hemosiderosis that might have this entity? 
I think that's probably I think that's probably true. Yeah. So arthritis, interstitial lung disease, and pulmonary hemorrhage. Arthritis. Uh, so, wow. but I, I think the take home is that you know these unusual distributions of interstitial of especially of the UIP or IPF younger patients uh, often have familial or or some sort of telomere shortening and and yeah so cirrhosis is a good question uh, early graying is another good question in these patients I so. Yeah, this is um, and just another case, and we, you know, we see one of these every month or so, just as some weird familial pattern. Since we get so many referrals in here, um, I want to show this one really quick. This is a lady who had a prior heart transplant, as you can see, and she had a recent, and this was back early August. She had a recent bout of of acute rejection, so they hit her with harder steroids and harder immunosuppression, and now has this fairly subtle consolidation you can see projecting over the right hilum and on the lateral view you can see it's sorry it's hard to window this but it looks like it's more posterior so superior segment right lower lobe and this is one that you can see here this is a CT done the next day and you know this area of consolidation it's you know, it's awfully wedge shaped almost looks like a, an infarct um, but she's febrile at the time and immunosuppressed. And what's interesting in this case, oh man, I guess I lost some of the images. She does actually have some small pulmonary emboli, but it was in a different segment. And we didn't really see anything going into this superior segment. And I thought this peripheral area of consolidation uh, you know, kind of spanned multiple segments anyway. You can see she's got some weird anatomy. I think she's just got a, some volume loss in her right upper lobe too. Uh, but she didn't get any better. In fact, she got a little bit worse. And you can see there's some central areas of cavitation in here and some small yes. air bronchograms. And then a week later, you've got more necrosis. We were certainly worried about some sort of fungal infection. Uh, we actually did a CT guided biopsy that grew mucor. And then they went in and did a right lower lobectomy and resected this as she continued to progress. And it was mucor that caused this. But uh, and there's a, and I didn't pull up the paper for this, but they're in the infectious disease literature. They've looked at at some of the features that you can help identify invasive fungal infections, and I think it's in clinical infectious disease a couple years ago. And they talked about just abrupt arterial cutoff being a sign that's often seen in the setting of of angioinvasive fungal disease. But what I thought was interesting about this case was the fact that there was this pulmonary embolism here, or what looked like it was probably an embolism, but I wonder now if this was angioinvasive fungal infection or if it's just, you know, is it too good of a coincidence to have this angioinvasive disease right here and then happen to have a PE just lower down in the same lobe? I don't know. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> but um, I was actually, we kind of did the biopsy just to pacify the infectious disease team because I thought we weren't going to grow anything but we actually did grow fungus so um, just because our yield on growing stuff when it's not cancer is pretty low but it's just a good example of a of an angio invasive fungal infection yeah so and just kind of hemorrhagic appearance like we often see you know it's not quite the bird's nest that that you know that you guys have talked about with some of these other cases but it's getting there so excellent yeah great cases yeah all right so that's it yeah thanks thanks everyone thanks great cases uh travis and brent all right thanks everyone just after uh two o'clock my time see everyone next time all right take care bye, everyone. thanks bye, bye.